All right. Oh, that's really loud. They don't have a lapel mic, which is great because I don't have a lapel. Um, so it works out very well. So they gave me a hand mic because I have two. Um, you're a great audience. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and get started. If you intended to come to the auditorium class taught by me uh, in the book of Revelation, you're at the right place. If not, go. Uh, find wherever you're supposed to be. Uh, it won't matter. Uh, hopefully those of you who didn't get sleep last night will get a good nap through this. Uh, typically people who are asleep during my class have become very jealous. Um, is my favorite time to sleep, is through my own classes. Um, so we're going to begin with a prayer and then start into the book. I want to apologize last week. Uh, I wasn't here. I don't, know, I don't know why I'm apologizing for being sick. Uh, so I just want to say I was sick. Uh, I was not here. So I'm sorry if you missed me. Uh, if you miss me, you have a very sad life. I'm just going to say that right now. There is something wrong with you. Uh, so let's pray, and then let's dive into it. Our Father, we are thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ, and the revelation that he gave John in the book of Revelation. And we just pray, Father, that as we approach this book, open our eyes, give us a spirit of humility, and help us. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. All right. So, uh... I decided to do something pretty simple this quarter for Josh, told, told him I would do the book of Revelation. Uh, you might actually think that's a jest, but I think overall in terms of theology, most books are going to tend to have things within it that are so controversial. You might as well go with a book that no one understands and I can say anything I want to about it and you can't argue with me. Um, now, and you may think that what I wrote up there is half a, is pure jest, but there is a little bit of truth to that. You're not going to agree with everything or anything I say about this book. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can go online and find thousands and thousands and thousands of interpretations. So why are we studying this to begin with? Well, number one, the book is in actuality called a revelation, which means something that is revealed. In other words, the book itself was always intended to be understood. And we're going to find out why it wasn't. And we're going to kind of take a pretty good introductory uh, view of it from the very beginning and talk about the nature of the book a little bit. I'm not going to go into a lot of details because there's even a lot of discussion and argument about that. Because when we think of the book of Revelation, this is what we think about, right? Doom, destruction, undead, rising, eating your brains, uh, things like that. These type of visionary experiences we have when we think about apocalypse or revelation end time is the destruction of the world. Unfortunately, the word itself and the intention of the book can't be more opposite than that. The book itself is about recreation. It's about renewal. And in essence, it's about hope. Because it's written within the context of a time in which the church was living on the peripheral of society. And that is something else I want to really want to talk about because this is the reality, this is the reason why I chose this book. Um, now, I'm not one of these people who thinks, oh, things are so much worse now. I'm not one of these people who want to go back to the way they were. Sometimes I think that mainly because I'm white. I think if you went to congregations of different ethnic groups, they wouldn't want things the way they were. I think there needs to be a progression forward in which we begin to see the intention of God's plans within culture. And every once in a while, I think what the church needs to do is reattach themselves from our culture, especially the aspects of culture which become so deeply embedded in that we can no longer distinguish between church and that aspect of culture and redefine ourselves, and then move back into culture. And I think, in reality, that's kind of where we are. And I think that's our biggest problem. And I'll talk more about that in terms of what I mean as we go. So, 
Let's talk about Revelation. We typically define this as apocalyptic literature. And I'm not going to spend much time on this slide, so don't worry. But one of the things I want you to realize is that apocalyptic literature is written in a highly symbolic way, which means we do not take it literal. From the very beginning, John says, I write signs to you, which is the same word he uses in the Gospel of John to indicate those things that point beyond what Jesus is doing to the reality of his person. So from the very beginning, we understand that this is written in a highly symbolic way that is supposed to engage your imagination and to evoke emotion. Some of these images are supposed to frighten you. But it's, it, the book of Revelation is kind of like that, uh, what is it, pointillism, uh, that type of painting, where if you get too close to the picture, all you see are what? Dots. And you think to yourself, why did this person paint a picture of a bunch of dots? But if you pull back and you allow those dots to emerge together, you begin to see the picture as it's intended to be. Because listen to this, Kipri, sometimes the details are only meant to paint a larger picture, not to be interpreted. And within the context of symbolic language, highly symbolic, evocative, emotional, symbolic language, that's the intention. That is why through the book of Revelation, I'm going to show you pictures of the kind of things in which they John C, so you can understand the emotional response that he has. I don't care how many times Jesus tells you, do not fear. What John sees evokes fear. And the reason why Jesus had to tell him not to fear is because Jesus knew this is a terrifying image. And so this is the way revelation is expressed. Now, in, in, in much of the, uh, there is a whole slew of apocalyptic literature that was written during the second to the second century, I think I put second century AD, but it may be into the first century, in which is both Christian and Jewish. So this was not an uncommon type of literature for these people to pick up. The most famous, of course, is First Enoch and Fourth Ezra. Uh, First Enoch and Fourth Ezra actually depict a son of man descending in some type of authoritative royal position taking the throne. Very similar to Daniel chapter 7 and what you find in Revelation. And 1st Enoch and 4th Ezra actually predate Revelation. And a lot of the imagery and the ideas that you have here are formed from this. And there are several books in the Old Testament that are apocalyptic in nature. With Zechariah, the last, most of Zechariah. This is the reason why we don't study Daniel 7 through 12, right? We end at 6. Because we're too frightened to move into all that apocalyptic imagery. But here is sort of the... the, the, the the quality of the, I mean, the, the type of literature, uh, the, type, the characteristic of that literature is basically, is that typically in apocalyptic literature, it's mediated by some type of heavenly being, which is here. But interesting enough, the mediator in here goes back and forth between Jesus and his angels. Typically in apocalyptic literature, it's some type of angel. And it is highly dualistic. Meaning, it's like the old cowboy shows where you have the good guy and the bad guy. You know who's good, you know who's bad. And the imagery that's expressed in Revelation is you've got the bride of Christ and the prostitute. You've got the city of Jerusalem and the city of Babylon. You have the marriage feast of the Lamb, and you've got the Carrions feasting on the dead of the unfaithful. Highly evocative, dualistic language that dep depicts good and evil unquestionably. And it is crisis literature in which is intended to write to, to a people who are suffering to give them, here it is, Hope. Hope. Now, most of the revelatory, the uh, apocalyptic literature written by Jews is typically associated with some character like Moses or Adam or Abraham. Um, the difference in this is that it's actually associated with an individual who they know is in reality John. I'm not going to really go into that. There's some question about who this John is. Uh, I think it's John the Apostle. I wouldn't lay my life on that. Uh, there's some indications of a John the Elder, which could very well be the same. We don't know, but I would lay my hopes on that. But here's the big question. Revelation really doesn't fall within that category wholesale. It, in actuality, embraces within it two other types of literature. It is an epistle, a letter written to seven churches, and we have to keep that in mind because contextually and historically, this has to mean something to them before it means something to us. 
I want to repeat that. Revelation has to mean something to the seven churches in Asia, which I think is symbolic of the entirety of churches in Asia Minor, before it means anything to us. And it is also, in actuality, calls itself prophecy. Now, prophetic literature doesn't foresee the future. Prophetic literature is an assessment of the social and historical and the religious and the economic climate of the time in order to, to, to show the people God's intention of whether or not he's satisfied with them or dissatisfied with them and what in the future God intends to do with them. Prophetic literature is much more moral and ethical than it is prof uh, future telling. And John is that. This is why from the very beginning you have churches to the seven letters, and I believe that the rest of the book is a commentary on what he says to those seven churches. And if you don't know Old Testament, you can't interpret this book. Of the 405 passages, there's 676 allusions to Old Testament images and passages. Think about that. Now, the majority of them come from Isaiah and Psalm, but, I mean, that's got to be the case. Psalm's 150 book, chapters long. Of course you're going to have more references in there than you're going to have Zechariah, you know, who's only 14. But I'll have to say, theologically speaking, what undergirds this is the apocalyptic imagery that you find in Zechariah because the images are very close to the, to the color, different colored horses, the variegated horses, um, and especially Ezekiel with the throne room images. And things such as that. And Daniel, if we can get to Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 10, you will see the very first chapter is just embedded in the language of Daniel 10. And so it becomes rooted in Old Testament theology. Now, why? And hear me out, because this is where I'm going to lose half of you. Because I believe that there's no discontinuity in the people of God between Israel and the church, we are the new Israel. We are an extension of God's work among his people, now reflecting his reign in a kingdom that he calls church, but also can be called new Israel. Now, I'm going to have to prove that as we go through the book, but I think it is very evident within Revelation in my own little, tiny, fragmented, ignorant mind. Oh good, it is there. I thought one slide wasn't there. Okay, so, there, this I think is one of the most essential elements to understanding what Revelation is all about. We do not have to know what emperor was in power when the book was written. There's a second century church father by the name of Irenaeus, who was from France, who wrote about this, looking back, and said it was written, the book of Revelation was written during the time of Domitian. Now, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of problems with this. Eusebius, an early church writer, um, talks about, I think he's got, was it Tacticus, Melita, I can look up here, I guess, oh, oh Tertullian, Melito, um, who talk about Revelation being written uh, during the time of Domitian, why? Because he was a persecutor of the church. The problem is this. There is no evidence, zero, of a worldwide persecution of the church under Roman authority, sanctioned by the Roman government until 250 AD under Decius and the subsequent impolar Diocletian. None. The persecutions that we know about that took place, such as under Nero in 64 AD when he set fire to Rome and the early Roman historian Tacitus has actually said that he blamed it on the Christians in order to take away blame from himself because he believed he actually had the fire started so he could rebuild Rome and build a Colosseum and build a new palace for himself and then he blamed on this new individual group called Christians that in reality they knew very little about. And I'll show you this in a minute. And so persecution began, but that persecution only lasted a few years and was only in Rome. Other than that, there is no evidence of a worldwide persecution 
of Christians. This goes back to something I talked about in terms of the symbolic language of Revelation. Now, eventually it will come, and maybe this is what John was doing, was looking forward to. But I, I think the reason why there is such vaulted language used in Revelation, there is such intense language used in Revelation, is because we tend to lose sight of the idea, and this will be a little bit later on in chapter 1 if I get there, that there is a heavenly reality that is taking place when earthly events occur. And sometimes the earthly event may seem insignificant when heaven is in turmoil. If you look at the crucifixion of one man on a cross in 30 or 33 or whatever time point it took place, A.D., from a historical perspective, it was insignificant on an earthly level. But the very cosmos itself went dark and shook. The vaulted language of revelation in terms of how it depicts historical events doesn't necessarily reflect the earthly reality. It reflects the heaven reality of what God is doing through that one event. And nothing is more cosmically significant than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And yet, from a historical perspective, it looked completely insignificant. Matter of fact, in 2nd century A.D. under John Hyrcanus, one of the, the early uh, Jewish rulers, he crucified 800 uh, Pharisees. I mean, it happened all the time. And so there is a heavenly reality that's behind it, and that's what we're going to see in Revelation. That when the church is at work, heaven is at work through it. And this is why I think we should really start to create distinctions where distinctions need to be made. Now, is this what I have? Okay. I have it up here. Emperor worship. This is a complex subject because it depends on where you are within the Roman Empire as to how this works itself out. Um, emperor worship didn't mean that they would look at Domitian and worship him as a god. As a matter of fact, Rome was very hesitant. Roman emperors were very hesitant in doing that. When emperor worship began, it began when Julius Caesar became emperor. And you know, you know that whole Roman history thing where they go uh, from uh, Senate ruled to emperor ruled? Well, when they moved into that emperor, that empire under Julius Caesar, Julius Caesar was put to death because he tried to gain too much power. So subsequent emperors wanted to stay very much far away from that. But when they meshed themselves into Greek and Egyptian culture, where they were very used to deifying their rulers and kings. Remember, uh, Pharaoh was considered Horus, the son of Re, the sun god, a sort of a divine manifestation of him on the throne. Alexander the Great was deified into a god after his conquest by the Greeks. The Greeks and the Egyptians and other cultures were very used to doing this. Rome was very hesitant. And when the emperors were asked to be worshipped, they said no. No. But what you can do is worship our genus and our ancestors. Any emperor who died would then ascend to the gods and sit with them, and they could be honored as a divas, which was not the same as a god, a deus. And you would offer sacrifices to them because in some ways it would benefit you because they sat with the gods. They start, stayed very away from allowing you until a little bit later on to be worshipped as a god. Now, what happened was they also said that with emperor worship, you were to associate with that the god Dea Roma, which personified the Roman Empire. Now, suddenly, emperor worship did not become a religion. It became a social and political state. Offering libations, offering sacrifice to the emperor wasn't saying that you worshipped him. It was in essence saying, I am loyal to the Roman Empire. And not doing it was treason. Now, the Jews were allowed an exemption. They had so much of a history with the Roman Empire, they said, forget it, let's just give you an exemption. The Jews could offer a sacrifice to God on behalf of the Roman Empire. 
and for Christianity because it was a Jewish religion from the beginning. We tend to forget from Acts chapter 1 through 6, it's Jewish. There are no Gentiles. That's why they got along so well. It's because there was homogeneity. There was cultural homogeneity. Jews got along with Jews. Churches fell apart when diversity entered. But Christians were able to live under this Jewish exception because Rome thought they were just a Jewish religion. But when Claudius expelled them from Rome in 40 AD and there were still Christians there, he expelled all the Jews because of a problem under the, because of a, of, of an argument over this guy, Crestus. Uh, Claudius thought, hey, we still have Christians here and we thought they were Jews. And so Rome started figuring out, this isn't Judaism. This is how Nero ended up persecuting them because they became such an obscure group because in the end, Christianity will begin to be uh, accused of atheism. Because when Rome conquered a nation, they didn't tell them to get rid of their gods. What they told them to do was add emperor worship and Deus, Dea Roma into it so that no matter what they worshiped, they were still loyal to the Roman Empire. But Christianity couldn't do it. And unfortunately, the idea of idolatry and the idea of this, this commitment to Rome not only took place on a political level, but unfortunately on a socioeconomic level. If you were a member of a guild and you didn't associate with the pagan deities that were somehow patrons of that guild, your business didn't survive. And so, saying all this, the persecution that's taking place for the Christians, isn't that they're being killed. It's social, religion, economic, political ostracism. They're being pushed to the fringe of society to where they just simply can't survive. And God sees this as such a horrific thing that the images that he's going to use to depict Rome are going to be explained in Revelation that God finds it so offensive that this is the kind of, the, this is the way he sees it. So understand that. Because early Christianity wasn't so embedded in its government and its society that it had a voice. It lived on the margins. But here's the thing, it thrived. So, listen to, these, listen to this very carefully. Disagree with me as you will. When we study the book of Revelation, we cannot take an egocentrical approach and think somehow because everything terrible is happening to me, it must be the end time. We do that all the time. The world is no worse than it was 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, 2,000 years ago, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. It's just bad in a different way. And God has always dealt with it. So no matter what you do with Revelation, don't think the end of the world is here because stuff is happening to you and me. Now, the concept of millennial we'll get to, but the millennial and revelation is like this much of the book, and I don't know why we make such a big deal about it. This much. And unfortunately, we take this much of the book and we taint the rest of the book. Second, well, I just did that. The book of Revelation answers the problem of evil. It doesn't belong. And God intends to do something about it. And he is doing something, and whether you believe it or not, right now. The activity of God never ceased in the first century. It culminates in the end. And if that doesn't give you hope in the time of culture that we're living in, there's nothing I can say that will.
I'm going to talk about recapitulation and parallelism because I think that's the answer to the book of Revelation as we go. But basically what I think the book of Revelation does, it just repeats over and over again when you talk about uh, um, the seals and you talk about uh, the, the, scroll, the opening of the seals and the bowls and all that stuff. I think what John does is repeat the same scenario over and over again and yet looking at it from different angles in order that the people in the first century A.D. could understand their situation and what God is doing to reprieve them, to, to relieve them of the suffering and persecution. But we'll talk about this as we go, because I don't have time. Now, eschatology, end time stuff. End time stuff is not always about the end. I believe what Jesus Christ has done is inaugurated the end times right here, right now. We are in the last days, about to come to the culmination in the end. We have eternal life. Guess when? Now. Death is a door to a new life. And you will find that Jesus Christ himself will have the keys to life and death, to Hades. Hades is not hell. It's death. And heaven. This sort of sits within the same framework of interpretation, um, but I want you to understand this. This is, this is something I've heard people say that, that Revelation is, is, is opening up to what we will see when we go to heaven. I think nothing could be further from the truth. The visions of heaven in Revelation are visions of what God is doing now from his throne in control ruling when the churches were suffering and the heavens opened John says don't worry God is on his throne now And he gets this experience of the heavenly army that God utilizes to, to do as well. This is the hope part. I think this is the same thing. Oh, okay, so here. So understand this. If you think the book of Revelation is a code book to the return of Jesus Christ, you are basing your view on hermeneutical failure. People have tried to do this over and 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 over again. And there are people who attempted to predict the end of the world and ruined people's lives by setting dates, and they went out and sold their homes. Um, no one has been able to do it. And I think from a historical hermeneutical perspective, that is something I think we need to listen to God telling us, and that is stop. Stop doing that. It is not a code book to tell us when Christ is coming back. It is a revelatory experience that John has that will give us hope in times of suffering. And here's the key. It is written so vividly and generically that even when you put it within the framework of first century, it works any time the church pers is persecuted. You can lay it anywhere. And this, is, I think, is the major problem with Revelation, is you could almost lay the, the, the seven bowls anywhere and see how it works itself out in any experience the church has when it's persecuted. I believe that. I think I said that. So, yes, I've said all this. All right, this, I think, is where you're going to I'm going to read this and we're going to move on. We as a church are a distinct entity. We are. We present Christ not through force or legislation, but in our lives as individuals and community as the temple of God. This is the image you'll find in Revelation. We don't force people 
and to the acknowledgement of Christ as king. If the church immerses itself into other political, social, economic ideologies, it threatens the purity of its doctrine, its teaching, it will lose its identity in the mire of conflicting worldviews, whether they be conservative or liberal. Rome had laws that protected families and outlawed adultery. But they were the enemy. It will lose its identity in the mire of conflicting worldviews, whether they be conservative or liberal, and idolatry will ensue. Any church that becomes reliant on any person, group, or institution rather than God in Christ and the spirit for survival is in danger of polluting the purity of God's work. The church has to be a distinct entity. We have to rise above our nation. We have to rise above our culture. We have to rise above that, become the church, and then we can sink back in and do what we're supposed to do. I personally think we've become so polluted, we have no idea how to distinguish any of them. And I'm not talking about the left. I'm talking about the left and the right. All of these will fail and disappoint us. The only entity that's going to survive eternity is the church. Not Republicans, not Democrats, not Libertarians. Not people who are part of the Michael Bolton fan club. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Our worldview is the cross. Persecution is expected. And there's the passage. There's plenty more. Our king is a self-sacrificing, kind, patient, and gracious king. Judgment is his last resort. For it says, God so loved the world, not God so hated the world, he killed his son. This is, in essence, the principle of revelation that you have to take in consideration, especially when we get into the very violent, violent passages that talk about what God's doing among the world and his people. I don't know why. I put this on here. This is my outline of revelation. I do want you to notice. Okay, see 1, 1 through 18. It starts off with the epistle to the seven churches, testimony of the Son of Man. A, there are seven beatitudes. There's seven everything in here. Seven scrolls, seven seals, seven beatitudes, um, seven Doritos or whatever. Um, but it starts off with that. And note very carefully that the ending is a testimony, a warning, a beatitude that Jesus is coming quickly with this idea of I am Alpha and Omega. And you go back to the beginning. Oh, I can't go back. He says the same thing there. I am Alpha and Omega. In other words, it forms an inclusion. And yet the entire book is framed within this principle of the eternality of Jesus. The fact that he lives forever, he's eternal. And this becomes an essential point to those people who are facing persecution and possibly even death. The reason why you face it is because anything you gain in this world is temporal. But Christ is eternal. And so that's why we endure persecution. Now, that's the whole book of Revelation. Don't come back next week. Um, but the entirety of the book is sort of bound up in that inclusion of beginning and end. And you can go through, but you see the number of sevens that's in here. You see these interludes, and we'll talk about all this. Let's see if there's anything else. Oh, great. The book. Revelation. We're here. I have no time, but we're here. So I want you to keep all of this in mind. If you have any disagreements with me, I will give you Walt's email address. No, it's fine. But I, I, I do want to stress that we are intended to understand this book. And so we are going to go through it and talk about the difficult parts, the easy parts, whatever it may be. But let's start. I would ask for questions, but I don't care. Uh, Revelation 1. I don't have time. I don't have time for questions. Because I probably won't know the answer, and we'll have to let it go. 
Now, I don't have a lot of time, and I really want, at, at least in this, in chapter one, what I'm going to attempt to do is draw into some Old Testament books to show you the background and perhaps just allude to them later, but I want to show you at least in this um, section. But let's start with Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. And I put that as small as possible so no one could read it. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, automatically we have a problem. What is being revealed? Because in the Greek, this could mean the revelation about Jesus or the revelation from Jesus. And it is argued and argued and argued, but I think the ambiguity is intentional because I don't think it matters. We know that the revelation of the book is in essence about the nature of Christ, the character of Christ and his teaching, and we know that in many times Jesus speaks. So it may be an intentional ambiguity. And what I find about the, interesting about the book of Revelation is I think this is the only time in which the Holy Spirit himself really, I mean, the very few times the Holy Spirit speaks, and he will speak in the book of Revelation. So it begins with this. It is a revelation of Jesus Christ. It is not a revelation of John. But what's intended to be revealed is something about the character and the nature of this Jesus, and I'm going to say not Christ anymore, but Messiah. Because you will find what is embedded within this is this whole concept of the coming of the Davidic king. I think in the Old Testament that is one of the most important theological principles that need to be understood before you move into the New Testament and understand anything about the nature of Christ or the Messiah. Is he not just a king, he is the Davidic king. And I'll show you why that's important someday. But notice the chain of events that God gave to him, Jesus, to show to his bondservant, a uh, servant in the Old Testament uh, and the New Testament was a term that is utilized to a person who represented someone else. And so immediately John then in this uh, nomenclature servant becomes a representative of God in Christ, the message that Christ brings. And in actuality carries with it in the first century Authority, because the servant represented his master and carried that same authority. The things which, and this is a very ambiguous statement, and I'm just going to read it the way I think it should be read and probably wrong, quickly. So in other words, the events that he's referring to are about to occur. This is why I think it is Roman persecution, whether it is Nero or dementia, I don't care, or dementia, I don't care. It's the persecution under the Roman Empire that's about to take place and the implications of that from a heavenly perspective. And he sent signs by his angel. So it's God to Jesus, to an angel, to John, to churches. It shows you the extent of involvement within the heavenly world to these earthly matters, right? Because it isn't just God, it isn't just Jesus, it's the angelic hosts that will also participate in the events that are taking place within the church. Who testify to the word of God and to the testimony either about or the testimony from Jesus, everything that he saw. And here's the beatitude, the first of seven. Now, I read this when I was young, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get something special if I can read this book. I didn't get through the first chapter, put it down, and thought, yeah, I can do without it. Um, Blessed is the one who reads, and those who hear, and in Old Testament hearing is obedience, the words of the prophecies, and keep the things which are written in it. Because, not the time, not the ticks on the clock, but this is Kairos, the event, the moment. It's close. It's near. And that doesn't actually have to refer to a future event, could refer to something that is happening in their time that is close to them. John. To the seven churches in the, that are in Asia, I'm moving fast. Now, seven churches in Asia. 
The churches that are listed here later on actually perform a, a circuit, a sort of a pattern, a path, a road, in which if you were taking a letter, this is the path in which you would travel. But what is interesting, at the end of every book, there's a call, almost a universal call for anyone who's hearing this book, because there were numerous churches along the way. So I doubt that it was only intended for these churches. These churches were specifically pointed out because of their strategic location. They could expand it out from it. And, and, they were central locations that were highly enmeshed in the emperor cult and really needed this message because of the persecution that was taking place because of the refusal of some Christians to engage in it. And Asia is modern Turkey. I think it's on the western. It's on the left, whatever that is on the map, left, west side of uh, modern Turkey. Oh, you know what I didn't talk about? I'll come back and talk about it in a minute. This just reminded me. I thought y'all leaving money out there for me when I'm done. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, as an epistle, he says, grace and peace to you from... Now, this is interesting, and I'll talk about this. Well, I may not even get to it. I'll talk about it next week. Because this is a very interesting phrase. From him who is and who was, and notice that you don't go from a, a personal verb of is, but you actually come to more of a, of, a, of a verbal aspect of to come. But this phrase is not, how should I put this? This phrase is a name. It's not verbs, it's a verbal name. The way the Greek is laid out, it is almost the same, in the same vein which you find uh, in Exodus chapter 3 when God calls himself the great I am, taking a verbal component of the verb to be and make it into a name. And that's what this is. And more than likely, reflecting back to the Exodus event by saying that, is that this book is not only, and notice it starts with the present, not the past, the one who is right now with you. And who always was. And not the one who will be, but the one who will what? Come back. And probably the most controversial imagery, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. This has probably been one of the most argued passages in terms of who this refers to. There's really no conclusive um, identity of who the seven spirits are. But it is likely, and I think it is likely, and I could be wrong, probably am, that this is a reference to Zechariah chapter 4 when Zechariah has this visionary experience of this seven or this menorah with seven lamps uh, that sort of illuminate and feed these two trees, which represents Zerubbabel, the Davidic king, uh, the Davidic king, but the Davidic governor from the Davidic line who gave hope to Israel that God would bring back the Davidic line, and Joshua the high priest. But in that context, it says that these seven lamps are the seven eyes of God, but they also represent the presence of God, which is defined in Zechariah as the spirit of God. And so what you might have here is this very beginning Trinitarian expression that what is happening to you on earth has not gone unnoticed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Okay, I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to do this, and we're going to start in verse 5 next week, and we will never get through this book, but that's fine. But I did fail to talk about this when I talk about the whole concept of religion within the Bible. The reason why Judaism, I mean, Christianity was seen as an offense to the Roman Empire is that, I got I to remember this, Rome had two views of religion. There was religio and there was superstitio. Religion wasn't the same in the Roman Empire as it is today. It's not this personal faith that one has where you believe in God and you can go home you have a relationship with them. Religio in Rome was all about appeasing the gods through your actions to make sure that you succeed in whatever you were to succeed in. So if Rome went to war and lost in a certain area and they didn't know the local gods, they would find out who they were, sacrifice, and they believed they appeased the gods enough to succeed. Right? Superstitio was any religion 
that committed religious faux pas and offended the gods, and Christianity was seen as the worst superstitio of all. By the second century AD, up in Asia Minor, in an area called Bithynia, there is a governor by the name of Pliny who writes to Trajan, who has Christians before him, and he has no idea who they are or what he's supposed to do with them. And when Trajan writes back, he says, we've got no, I mean, we don't really have a standard of way of doing them, but if they don't offer worship, just kill them. Second century AD. So you see, even by then, Rome didn't regard Christianity as this extreme threat, but what you begin to understand is that Rome, when Rome became aware of Christianity, they called it, one of the early uh, historians of Rome, Tacitus, Tacitus called it a pernicious superstition because Christianity denied the Roman gods and the gods and put the stability of the Roman Empire in jeopardy, put the peace of the Roman Empire in jeopardy. And that's why later on they were accused of atheism and several other things because Rome just didn't understand this religion. And the worst thing of all, and I think we tend to forget this, is their leader, Jesus Christ, died on a cross. Now, I think we almost have a perception of that that is not the first century perception. The cross under the Roman Empire was considered the only time that it was considered uh, a means of execution that exemplified one thing, a traitor to the Roman Empire. You didn't die on the cross because of theft. You died upon the cross because you were a threat to the stability of the Roman Empire. That's why when the Jews went to Pilate, they didn't say he claimed to be God. They said he claimed to be what? King. So Christianity already is off on the wrong foot with Rome. This is why they're persecuted. All right. We have kids uh, since I married Amy. Go get them. Um, <laughs> I'm letting y'all go. Uh, we've already prayed. Pray for yourself if you want. Uh, but I realize I'm a little over and I want to live. So I'm letting you go.